So um, I've got a, you know, the opportunity to, to stay up on stage is something that I've uh, really looked forward to uh, for uh, the last few weeks and when John decided to join the panel. And, I, and he's going to cringe a little bit at this, but I, I can think of uh, you know, few people that actually have really a capability to bridge the morning conversation into the afternoon conversation like John does. Um, I've known John for about 20 years now. Um, John's background is as an Air, Air Force officer. He recently retired as a three-star general as the partnerships uh, person for the, the director of national intelligence. But he has a really strong background both in cybersecurity. Uh, David Sanger mentioned a program called SNP, a uh, system and network intern program. And uh, or he also mentioned TAO. And John came to me when I was in squadron command back in 2000, 2001, and uh, served as my deputy as we started one of the Air Force's first cyber units, uh, which at the time we called an information operations <laughs> unit. So you know, we've already watched the circle turn a whole, a whole uh, cycle from just cyber back into cyber and, and influence. But John has also served the nation this nation as uh, a senior intelligence officer, including being the director of intelligence uh, for the European Command. So he has a really unique view of how technology, you know, affects the challenges that the nation has, you know, its influences on society, not just U.S. society. As an intelligence officer, you're looking at societies all over the globe, uh, both as friends and foes. So he, he's thought deeply about the, you know, the nature of, the, of technolo technological change in addition, in addition to, like, to cyberspace. So uh, you know, welcome to the stage, and I think we'll have a, a great conversation. It's going to be relatively brief. So uh, you know, we, we agreed with the conference organizers that John and I are just going to carry on a conversation, and we'll move uh, to the coffee break after that. And, um, you know, Jay, if you could just give me a sort of cue as to when we need to, or Jen, to wrap it, to, to wrap it up. Um, so let's start with, you know, again, given these experiences you've had over the last 30 years, you know, where do you, what do you see in terms of the, the key sort of challenges and opportunities, both for cyber, but also more broadly around technology change? Sure. Thanks, Greg. And, and thanks to the school, thanks to Dean Janelle for uh, the invitation to come and be part of this session. Uh, there are a lot of different aspects to this problem, and one of the things that I really liked about the way this program was set up today was that you didn't artificially, no pun intended, separate the AI discussion from the cyber piece, because I think these are kind of inextricably linked, and I think we'll get into that discussion as we go through. But let me just give you an idea of, of how I come at these, these types of problems. First of all, you, you alluded to kind of my time as a director of intelligence. So one of the things you do when you're in that kind of role is you're always looking at the worst case. So that's how I kind of tried to frame these things. I never thought of myself as a lawyer, but then as I heard the discussions today about, hey, we're the people that ever bring everybody down, so were we, right? We were always the ones that say, but what if, right? And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the what ifs. And if I think about cyber and I think about artificial intelligence, there's a couple of aspects on the national security side that I think are really, really important. The first, I would say, is the competitive space, right? Yes, we are in a competitive sphere, kind of in the nation state side, but also in the corporate side. And we have to stay and keep, keep uh, our competitive uh, capabilities in that space. What I have learned from the time in government is, and I loved it, don't get me wrong. In fact, I was thinking about it. You know, that same cubicle that you and Jay had, I came and took Jay's spot uh, a little bit after that. So there was something in the water there in the Pentagon. But what I have learned in my time in the bureaucracy, so to speak, is that there are some things the government's really good at, and there are other aspects that the government's a little bit more challenged, right? This is not a not necessarily a big idea, but I would tell you that that's what I'm excited about here is this opportunity to kind of think about what can we do together as we work through these problems. Now the next one is the artificial intelligence aspects of these. I believe that we are at a kind of a, a threshold that is a little bit different. Um, I've seen the cybersecurity piece come up. You've just talked about how we haven't really made a lot of progress in the last 10 years. The artificial intelligence aspects, the machine learning pieces, 
are also going to be quite challenging. That other big national security implication for me is the societal impacts. If we leave large swaths of the population behind through either job displacement or other means, that is going to create some challenges. And then the last piece I'll talk about is when I look at the challenges that governments have writ large, not just the US government, but democratic governments in terms of meeting the needs of their constituencies, you add this one on to the plate, right? 70% right now of our funding is already, is, is mandatory for funding. If we're going to try and approach and deal with issues like job displacement, training a new workforce, where is that money and where is that going to come from? It's either going to have to build a bigger pie, we're going to have to bake a bigger pie, or we're going to have to cut that pie in a different way. So all of these are challenges that I'm, that I'm quite concerned with. So staying on the theme of sort of the technology's got challenges, but we need to meet them in, lieu, in sort of while advancing the opportunities. I think we've had a dialogue today. You and I have talked about, you know, one of the essential elements of that challenge is pace. So yeah. how do you think about pace, why that causes challenges, and, you know, thoughts about, like, how we might, you know, how do we deal with pace? Right. You know, it's interesting. If you, you go back... Um, I got my, my undergraduate in computer science, and my last research project was on artificial intelligence, ironically. And we were talking about the, the ways with which we could make that happen. Neural networks was one of the big, big topics that we were describing there. But we could not do it at that moment in time. We didn't have the compute power, we didn't have the storage capacity, we didn't have the data to actually instantiate what we wanted to do. Now we have that, and so what you're seeing now is the pace of change is coming really, really quickly. And when you have that level of pace, that level of change, it's often difficult for a bureaucracy, for a government to respond to that. Uh, one of the things I, that I looked at recently was the OECD. They, they recently released a report on the future of work, if you've seen it. I thought that was an interesting report, and what it suggested was it's not necessarily dystopian in terms of what we can expect, but that there will be challenges. Ironically, they said the way to fix this is to make sure that we have the right policies in place. And that's the piece that I'm a lot more concerned with because if you get back to your original question on pace, I think it's gonna be, we are going to be challenged, not just the United States, but our partners and allies to also be able to keep up with that pace of technological change in order to do that. I mean, what, what are your views on that? Well, you, uh, a thing that we've talked about, and we talked about, we had dinner last night, this notion of <laughs> policy is not the solution, right? Uh, which I think, you, you know, and I'll get to a, something that we worked on together before you left government. You know, uh, and, I'm, and I'll throw the, throw the ball back over to you when I do that. But we got into it in the last panel. Like, nor, if, if in the notion of global governance, norms are the policy, what, what behaviors should be expected, what should nations do, the challenge is actually, you know, creating implementation, which in right. the normative realm is actually creating some degree of accountability and you know, in enforcement mechanisms, as we've discussed. The, the challenge that you know, we've had in terms of collaborating in cyber defense for the nation is that the, op the operating environment now exists in the private sector, which as a, national, as a former national security and as a recent <laughs> national security <laughs> official, you know, this flips everything on its head, right? Where you know, basically national security concerns are the purview of government and governments have to decide you know, what actions will be taken. But that does not work well when cyber attacks, at least attacks at the level of you know, coercive behaviors between nations, are occurring in inherently private systems and at the front line is the security operations centers of, of, of private companies. So uh, you know, I guess, John, how, do you, how much progress do you think we've made on that? And is it harder to get progress on policy or is it harder to get progress on actual operational capability? So, yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is the expertise for operational capability, you just referred to it, right? That's in the private sector. 
we do not we, we quite frankly do not have the expertise uh, within the government to be able to build capabilities like we need to. So we're going to have to have a strong partnership to be able to do that piece of it. In, we go back to the policy front. I want to just step back for a second and look at the history just from, from what I've seen. So cybersecurity, right? We built an actual policy on cybersecurity in 1985, right? Some people call it the orange book. It was a DOD manual. And we had, and in it, it actually talked about how you can set security standards, security mechanisms, and security controls to build trusted systems. Now, why was that a challenge? A couple of things. Number one, you could say, well, it only applied to the DOD. Well, you look through it, and it actually says, we would like the private sector to also take a look at this so that they can also build uh, trusted capabilities into the products that they're developing, either for the US government or for the nation writ large. Doing that now, I think, is enormously challenging because of the pace that you talked about before. What are the incentives to the private sector to go through a security evaluation, to add the security level below that, to make sure that their product is safe and secure, while at the same time being beaten to market from, from that perspective? So that's why I see that, 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 that ability to get the actual policy out is going to be particularly challenging. Right, and, and, and I find you know, that even in places, we've made progress in, I won't go into all, all the specifics, but there's a pretty strong dialogue now with the private sector and the, the, the key government agencies, Homeland Security, uh, in our case, the Treasury Department, in the Electric Power Grid's case, the Energy Department, uh, the National Security Agencies and Defense and Intelligence. And in principle now, I think we've agreed that you know, collaboration is essential, but also that specific capabilities in terms of risk identification, um, you know, the intelligence support or the information sharing necessary, and even to plan responses for specific contingencies. But that, but you know, the implementation of this is challenged when there's not enough private sector expertise embedded in the government organizations with the author the authorities and. You know, I guess I'll ask a broad question about resources. Um, you know, do you think that, there are, in which now you're more at liberty to say, <laughs> you know, how, how well invested are we in cybersecurity as a nation? And are the investments in the right portions of the, you know, the portfolio, offense versus defense, or, you know, uh, protecting the government systems versus the government helping the private sector defend the nation's systems? Yeah, so... It's a fair question, and it's difficult for me to really assess completely, right? Um, the, the first aspect is much of that cybersecurity. So in terms of kind of securing kind of the government space, I think I feel relatively good there. I, I'm, I'm an optimist there. The glass is at least half full, that we're, we're reasonably good at securing our own networks. It's when you look at it more broadly from the critical infrastructure, from and, and then taking it to, to the further steps in terms of our overall nation that I think we have challenges. The second aspect of that is it's more than just the cybersecurity piece. There is, a, there is a recent article, I don't know if you saw it, um, and somebody alluded to CT scans earlier today, right? And so this, these are Israeli researchers, they were able to look at um, actually change CT scans and add cancer nodule, nod nodules or remove cancerous uh, indications on these CT scans. So first of all, that's a concern, obviously, if somebody, you either misdiagnose somebody that does have cancer or you suggest that they do. It fooled a lot of the radiologists that looked at it. There's a couple of other aspects to that that I thought were pretty interesting when you dug into the article. The first one was the reason that they were successful was they were actually intercepting the images as they went across an unsecured network. The reason that they were successful was because the images were not digitally signed. And so you have this, this challenge right now um, beyond just the policy piece of people that may be developing a capability, an AI capability, in a vacuum without also thinking about the security, cybersecurity mechanisms that are also going to be required to secure that overall system. So in other words, I think you're going to have to be able 
to have uh, teams that can, can both build capabilities from the AI, the AI functionality, but also recognize the cyber mechanisms that are going to have to be a part of it. Whether that's a policy piece, I moved away from your question a little bit, but whether that's a policy piece or not, in terms of trying to keep up with that, I think is going to be a significant challenge. Well, let, let, I want to build on that because uh, the notion of how interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary are solutions. So we got into a discussion, in part prompted by questions from the audience, about the role of individuals. And you know, as we think about, I, I personally don't believe, uh, not coming, I'm not an engineer, I don't come from a computer <laughs> science background, I actually come from a lot of international affairs uh, <laughs> degrees. But you know, when I think about these problems, they're not gonna be solved technically. I mean, the holy grail for technologists is to build boxes or encryption or systems that really are bulletproof and won't be hacked. I believe for some of the reasons that you've said and have been discussed, the economic incentives uh, you know, will result in systems that are less than fully securable. So then you start to get into this layered set of mitigations that include governance, which we've talked about, but also you know, uh, the behavior of individuals. So what are the set of disciplines necessary in our solutions? Can you solve these things in acad academic or you know, um, sort of intellectual stovepipes? Or do you inherently, should we be seeking more multidisciplinary solutions? Yeah, for, for me, I think the answer is the multidisciplinary approach, right? And not just from kind of, and not just all within a techno technological Place, right? Don't just bring the cyber folks and kind of the AI machine learning team together. I think that's one aspect of it. Um, but remember, I can't remember which panelist it was that talked about it earlier today, but it was basically saying that companies sometimes are surprised that, they're, that the capability they developed was used in the way it was when it was used exactly as it was supposed to be used, right? So for example, we know we don't want an automated vehicle to hit us, right? That is great. That's what I want built in. But it also makes it pretty easy to take it even a step further of not only having to figure out the trolley problem of which person am I going to hit if there's several people on the road, but also it enables a form of civil disobedience, anarchy, et cetera, that has to be thought through. So there's a behavioral piece to this. So that's where I'm going with this, is how can we set things up that take advantage of how individuals behave? I think of, of kind of the behavioral economics side of this, right? In terms of, of how can we, in essence, nudge good behavior? What are the default settings out of the box on IoT? That would be a really good one just to make sure that we don't rely on the, the human element here to have to do all of the security configurations. Right. That's one aspect. I'm sure there are other pieces that I haven't thought of, other disciplines. No, I mean, I, you know, uh, being involved in some of the efforts up here at Columbia in, in, in a discussion with uh, one of the graduate students who's about to work on her PhD and, and reviewing her dissertation proposal, you know, bringing some of this methodology from economics, particularly behavioral, you know, the move for economics into behavior, it's all about large scale societal, you know, outcomes, hopefully, in, in, in trying to drive them to a positive way. So I think that's something that as cyber people, as a, a person that was raised in sort of 20 or 30 years of how we think about cyber, we've done little of, and that's why universities are such a, a rich setting. So maybe I'll sort of you know, conclude with the notion of two things. As a, for, you know, as a former senior intelligence official, government official, and, and a thought leader in that, Two, two related questions. What would you have needed more from, from the private sector, or where do you think you know, the private sector's engagement with government on cyber needs to go? And similarly, in this setting, you know, where can academe help? And you know, what do policy schools need to do? What do computer science departments need to do to help serve, you know, not necessarily service government ends, but to serv service the nations and even global ends in terms of improving the situation? Yeah. So let me start with the academic piece first and okay. then re remind me of the other part. So on the academic piece, clearly there is rich, rich ground beyond just the development pieces of this. Um, the research into vulnerabilities, how to provide secure systems, those types of pieces, that's, that's certainly 
one really, really important aspect of it. There's also, I think, a lot to be said on the policy side too, though. I think we could, we need to start exploring policies now. And for example, let's take this, this whole concept of what are the policies, what's the right policy going to do if, if in, it does turn out that large segments of the populations, not just the United States again, but across the world, are displaced. I worry deeply about that because large disaffected populations create, can create some pretty significant challenges for governments, but also just kind of the, in, the instability in the overall system. So what would those policies look like? What would be a proper policy that allows for job retraining? How do you cover it? How do you pay for that? Um, what does that look like in a democratic institution, democratic government versus non-democratic? So again, there's a lot of, I think, really important work that could be done at both the policy side and also the technology side in the academic setting. Then finally, um, from a government perspective. Oh, from the, pro like, oh. the question is like, as a government official, yeah. you know, I spend there my we. days often trying to articulate <laughs> and find the right collaborative space with government and what I need, what, you know, the, in this case, the financial sector would like government to do to improve cybersecurity. Yeah. For as I, at, looking at it from the other side, what do you think the private sector can do? What, the, what are the, the types of contributions we can make to solving national or societal problems when it comes to cy cybersecurity? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's a couple of different areas that I think of from, from that perspective. Uh, the first is the expertise and insight, right? Uh, there's no doubt that the expertise in this particular area in terms of developing both good cybersecurity mechanisms, but also how are we going to leverage AI for good is going to be an important aspect. The second one is just have the willingness to talk, right? There is, in some, to some degree, an unwillingness to talk with the government because it's considered maybe we don't want to work with the government, it hurts our brand, et cetera, right? <laughs> right, and, and just you know, to nuance that a bit, there's concerns, I think, about brand or too close a relationship to the government. You know, I, I'm going to broadly characterize this as West Coast concerns due to revelations. There's also, like from an East Coast perspective, you know, uh, regulatory concerns and rules yeah. and you know, the notion that legally we've set up barriers between the government and in both directions, the government and the private sector talking. And, I, you know, in this realm, I think we as a nation are actually disadvantaged because that wall between government and the private sector legally, and we pay attention to it, is much higher yeah. than almost anywhere else on the globe, in my estimation, even in other democracies, right? So yeah. we have a harder time with this collaboration yeah. than I think many, most other nations have. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting the nod from Jay, and, and I know that everybody wants coffee. So I agree with you completely. Uh, it's, it's a great dialogue that we can continue over coffee, and thanks again very much. For right, and it, thank the audience. Uh, both John and I will be here through uh, the course of the, the remainder of the afternoon and the, the reception. So if there's any questions, please, please grab us. Yep.